Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and Lovely. Now, this is usually a weekly show, but it's been about a month since our last show and there's no real bad reason for this. I've just been super busy with my work life. Also, I have a young family, I have two very small children, and so uh, when they're sick, uh, we get sick and it's just a big pile of sickness. But uh, everyone is healthy again now and my schedule has cleared out quite a lot, so we should be back to weekly shows. Now, uh, we have a lot of very exciting things happening in the next few weeks on Electromaker. This week is a super exciting show, but it's also a show I've been sort of dreading because this is the week where we announce the competition where I give away the Latte Panda 3 Delta. I've really enjoyed fiddling with this uh, x86 single ball computer with an Arduino built in. It's a wonderful piece of kit and it will be going out to one of our subscribers. We also have a very full show just full of fantastic um, maker inventions and things you can support on crowdfunding websites and some updates from Electromaker. So without any further ado, let's get on with the show. We are going to start this week's show by looking at the August winners of Electromaker of the Month. Now, if you aren't familiar with Electromaker of the Month, we have a rolling competition on our website, which is designed to basically give prizes to people for their projects. Um, under the project pane of the Electromaker website, which is under community here and projects, you'll probably see it at the top here. I just have this super zoomed in because it looks better on the show. Um, you can upload your projects. You just need an Electromaker account, which is completely free to make. Um, and uh, we have a really nice system to upload your projects and make them look nice. You can even just import them from other websites if you've already published them somewhere else. And once they're up on the site, every month a panel of judges will go through and uh, pick three projects to celebrate. And by celebrate, we mean give prizes to. Every single month in 2022, the winner of Electromaker of the Month will get a pile of Nordic Semiconductor Prototyping Kit. Now, I've talked about all of these things at length on the show in the past, um, but in short, the NRF 5340 is an amazing Bluetooth Low Energy Development Kit. Um, this board breaks out pretty much everything the chip can do, and if you ever wanted to fiddle around with Bluetooth, it's a great way to do it. The Thingy91 is something that still blows my mind to this day. I love it. It's got a battery in it. It's got GPS, NFC. It's got a bunch of sensors in it. Um, you could yeah, strap this to your body and do biohacking of some kind. You could use it to track your dog. You could do a million and one things with it. It's great. Uh, you also get a tile and a Nordic semiconductor mug. That's what the winner gets, along with a $50 Amazon gift voucher. Um, and the second and third prizes win a bunch of Electromaker swag, as well as a bunch of Nordic semiconductor swag. And you may notice there's an NRF 52840 dongle here too. This is a fully fledged USB Bluetooth low energy development kit. It's an amazing thing. And it when we first announced this competition, I didn't really realize quite how good this thing Thing was until I had to fiddle with one myself. Yeah, they're really they're really good ways of learning about Bluetooth Low Energy. So with all that said, let's meet the winners for August. Now this is the article I will be linking in the description of this video. If you head to that um, uh, link, you will find that this link in the first paragraph takes you to the page that tells you all the stuff I just told you about in case you would like to enter Electromaker of the Month, although really you just have to upload your project, there's nothing else you need to do. Um, and uh, this also goes through all of the different winners this month. If you would like to see any of these, you can click on the titles and it will take you to the actual uh, project page that our judges read and decided whether it would be a winner or not. So, uh, the first one is building your own QR code lock uh, uh, system, basically. This isn't just the hardware side of it, this is a framework for building management. This is a small team of Polish students, um, and uh, yeah, this is really quite an incredible thing. Um, so these are the lads that have put it together, um, and in short, if I show you this image here, you can see there's a motion sensor here, um, which detects when someone's coming up, um, and that will turn on the uh, image reader here. This is the QR code reader, um, and the QR code reader at the minute is working with a Raspberry Pi. They say they're going to change it to an ESP32 uh, at some point soon, because this is an in-progress project. Um, the winners of this pro uh, Electromaker of the Month don't have to be completely finished projects. This is just a documentation project, and yeah, even at this stage in the project, this is fantastic. So, in short, someone walks up, it turns on the reader, and a generated QR code, which can be uh, on the browser, but is also going to be sent to a mobile phone app, will turn up and you can get that scanned. Now, there is a central system that determines which QR codes have accesses to which locks. And uh, the relay here is the stand-in for a solenoid electronic lock that you find in a bunch of buildings already. 
So in short, these are generated QR codes which with a certain level of access. And then you scan the QR code with the code reader, like it says, it will open the lock for five seconds and send, uh, send an event log to the central website. It is a really nice idea for a framework. But the other thing about this project that's fantastic is the detail they go into as to how they've put it together and how you can make this project too. Now, this is an ongoing project. They have a YouTube channel. Um, the video that is linked uh, in this project and also linked here, um, you can see uh, what they're working on now. They will continue working on this for quite some time um, and it's just a really wonderful idea now this is um, you know a project that is ongoing there's certain hurdles that will need to be jumped over QR codes inherently aren't quite as secure as say access cards because you could say I don't know take a screenshot of someone's QR code and use it on your phone um, but then again if they know that the person is sitting next to them and then suddenly it shows up on their central server that that person opened a door somewhere else in the building you know you have a security leak as it is all centrally logged but yes, um, our judges were really into the fact that this kind of younger team of people um, yeah, approached the software side of this project as a full framework, but also little details like the hardware uh, sensor that detects if someone is there, the motion sensor, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's only going to turn on the more expensive power hungry stuff and the networking stuff when someone is there. Uh, which is yeah, just a nice little touch. It's kind of forward thinking in terms of hardware because power is always an issue when it comes to hardware. So congratulations, Swawek13, if that's how I pronounce your username, and your entire team of people working on this, you will be receiving a whole bundle of Nordic uh, kit. And it's always very exciting when we announce the winners of this, because usually, because of the nature of the fact that they won the contest, it's a kind of exciting thing to wonder, like, what will they come up with with this extra hardware? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we will find out, I hope. So uh, on to the second place. In second place this month, we have Real-Time Smoke Detection with Sensor Fusion, a project by Blatz01. Now, this is a tiny ML project that uses an Arduino uh, Nikola Sense ME board with a bunch of different smoke detecting sensors, and you can see a GIF of it in action here. Um, what gives this project its name, the Sensor Fusion, is the fact that, like I say, it uses a bunch of different types of smoke detectors. Um, so uh, this uh, article, once again, uh, well, it's, it's not an article, but it reads like one. This project goes through the idea behind this of using all these different kinds of sensors, gathering that data and using a collection of those different sensor readings together to determine whether you're actually detecting smoke or whether it's some kind of a false alarm. And that is where Tiny ML comes into it. This uses the Newton AI platform, uh, which is an online no code platform for training models using data sets. You can collect a bunch of data, um, which is what's happening here. So uh, this is using a professional smoke machine to say, look, this looks like smoke, but it isn't actually smoke, whereas the smoke from the wood smoker is actual smoke. And the different sensor readings can collect all of that data and train a model to detect different kinds of smoke in the future as to whether it is dangerous or not. I hope I explained that all right. But yes, you can see by the length of this project that there is a lot of explanation in there. And having read through it, it is very well explained, even to someone like me, who is a bit of a noob when it comes to tiny ML. It also takes you step by step through how you can create the model using Newton. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with Newton, we weren't uh, a short time ago, but um, uh, we uh, ended up finding a bit about them. I actually hosted a webinar for them, which was very uh, educational for me. I was, they were sort of out of the blue, asked me to do so because I do this. I talk to cameras professionally, so they wanted a host and I hosted their webinar and uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Essentially, this is an online way of training tiny uh, ML projects without having to write any code. Uh, you can upload training data to Newton and it will create a model that is so small it will even fit on a microcontroller like an Arduino Uno or something. Um, and you can deploy it, um, which blows my mind that that can work, that the technology exists these days for machine learning to work on microcontrollers. Anyway, um, this was a very well-deserved second place. Congratulations, Blatz01. In third place this month was a project from Yesh Vanth M. And this project really appeals to me uh, because anything to do with music and microcontrollers and you do your own forms of sound generation is something that I find inherently interesting. Music and microcontrollers is my thing. But this goes a step beyond. This is taking a technology that I dimly was aware of before and giving a real example of it using fairly simple bits and pieces. This is Li-Fi, and I just want to show you what it is before I even start explaining it.
So this video kind of blew my mind when I first saw it. This is a laser uh, module with two solar panels. When you put it down between them, it stops one of the speakers playing because each solar panel has a speaker connected to it. And as you can see, when he blocks the light pattern there, you heard before it stopped the music. This really is sound being uh, sent over light. Now we're used to sound being trans uh, transmitted wirelessly. Most of us have wireless headphones of some kind these days, or we use Bluetooth speakers. We're used to sound being sent to our devices over Wi-Fi. We've been sending sound over radio for over a century. Sending sound via lights is something that feels kind of fresh and quite exciting to me, even though the technology idea behind it is not all that new. Um, but yeah, the other thing that I find incredible is just what was used to make this, because other than the red pataya, and if you're wondering what a red pataya is, it is this beautiful beastie. I am so hyped to get my hands on a red pataya one day. I haven't had the chance to play with one yet, but it is a Swiss army knife tool for working with all kinds of signals. It's basically an FPGA board with a really advanced input and output. You can use it as an oscilloscope, but you can also use it as a function generator. Here, it was being used to generate the sound, but also to read the sine wave. Um, as you can see, if you read through this, this fantastic write-up. Um, yeah, uh, he used the red pataya as a way of actually uh, testing the sound pulses um, by sending this laser module here, just a generic laser module you can get for very cheap, firing it at a generic solar panel module, and then reading the data that came out of it. And yeah, you can see in the background here, this is what is happening. Um, and you take that a little bit further, and you end up with what I just played you, which sort of blows my mind a little bit. So other than saying that blows my mind too many times, what else is it about this project that I find so interesting? Well, the red bataya is the only complex part. Everything else is incredibly simple. Um, this is a generic solar panel, this is a generic laser module. There are a few small generic parts and a speaker that you could pull out of almost anything. Um, anything that you could actually generate the right wave pattern with the laser could do this. And that's what I find really interesting. Um, although again, uh, the fact that uh, red bataya is being used here kind of excites me because you can uh, program a red bataya with pretty much anything. You can use Python, you can use C, you can, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. This won third place for Electromaker of the Month this month. Congratulations, Yesh Vanth M. Thank you to absolutely everybody who puts things on our website. Um, I do various jobs here at Electromaker. I make this show, um, I, but I, you know, a lot of the other things that I do involve looking at the community projects so that I can write about them on social media or maybe put them in the show. Um, my favorite thing that I do at Electromaker is see the things that other people make. Um, if you are getting started with this or you've been doing this for years and you have a project that that you think will blow people's minds, please do share it on the site. It's my favorite thing to do to read these projects. It really is. Before moving on, we're going to very quickly look in the Electromaker Discord server. Um, there is a link to this Discord server in the description of this video if you would like to read what I'm reading now. I'm really going to just gloss over it. Um, but this is the EuroCircuits PCB challenge uh, uh, channel, challenge, contest channel, contest channel. <laughs> Um, and uh, in case you are not familiar, the EuroCircuits PCB contest is a contest we are currently running, although um, it is in uh, the sort of middle to end stages now. And uh, the contest was to design a PCB of any type um, and uh, submit it to a panel of judges. And the ones that they picked most would then get made by EuroCircuits, which is a, Euro, uh, a PCB fabrication house here in Europe. Um, and then you would get your PCB and be able to build something out of it. And that project then goes into the competition and you can win up to $1,000. And there is a second and third prize of something like $750 and $500. I'll check that to be absolutely certain. And a couple of other uh, categories as well. Like there's a social media prize and there's also an environmentally conscious prize. Um, so the first little bit of information is that the deadline has been extended by two weeks. Um, this is simply down to the fact that there was a few shipping problems with some of the PCBs. Um, you know how, to, how it is if you've ever tried to get something sent to you. Sometimes there are just delays. Living here in Germany, it seems like if someone sends something from further than the next street over, I have to wait a little bit longer. However, the really exciting stuff is happening here in the channel. Um, there are a bunch of different people chatting about uh, the PCBs they've received and what they're planning to make and how it's all coming together. And it's just really interesting seeing how it's how it's working. Um, one of the themes that's come up a couple of times is quality. That uh, These are really high quality PCBs, um, which is really nice to hear because I had no previous experience with EuroCircuits whatsoever. I've met Dirk, the CEO um, at, at uh, Embedded World, and really nice dude. Um, but to hear that um, these PCBs, are, you know, these domestic PCBs are of a really high quality and some of them are outshining some of the really cheap fabrication houses on the other side of the world kind of pleases me, um, uh, not for any particularly domestic European patriotic reasons, but it's nice to think that you can get something made close to home that doesn't have to be shipped halfway around the world to you. Um, and uh, also, uh, just yeah, it's just really interesting seeing the ideas that are coming together. So, for example, uh, this is this one was done with a handheld one. I'm trying to remember who's doing what. 
there's someone who's making a really interesting... Look, this isn't for me to talk about right now. Um, in this channel is everything that's happening with the PCB contest. I am super excited to see what comes out of this in the end. This is the most unique competition we've ever done. Um, so the project deadline is going to be the 4th of October, um, but we're giving our uh, panel of expert judges a little bit of time to really go through all of these because there's obviously a bit more complexity than uh, development board-based projects. On the 18th of October, we will be announcing the winners, and uh, I am so excited to see the stuff that people have come up with. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, um, there will be a link to our Discord server in the uh, description of this video. You can also uh, look under the contest tab on the Electromaker website, um, and that will show you uh, that as well. Uh, so if you basically on the Electromaker website, I'll come straight to it here, but if you click contests, you will see the EuroCircuit PCB contest is here, and you can read all about it. Um, and yeah, look, there is Embedded World, and there's Dirk Stans probably somewhere in the background here. Um, yes, this is the most interesting contest that we have done, and I'm really, really excited to see who wins and the projects, and yeah, it's going to be great. If you are getting started with microcontrollers and programming, this video is for you. Robin Mitchell is an educator and engineer. He is also works here at Electromaker, as you can see, and um, he makes fantastic detailed videos about uh, microcontrollers and what you should use for different projects, and this one is specifically about programming languages. He'll delve into assembly language C and C++ and Python, along with Java. Uh, um, I'm terrified of Java. Um, and, uh, and go into the different plus points and negative points and how easy they are to learn and all this kind of stuff. Um, and hopefully, if you are just getting started started in the microcontroller and embedded world, it'll give you a little bit of guidance as to what you can uh, learn. My own two cents on the matter is that you should learn whatever makes most sense to you to start with at the time, and then work outwards from that. Um, I started programming Python on the Raspberry Pi. I already knew a little bit of C++ before that, but then I didn't really delve hard into C and C++ until I was well into my Arduino uh, years, as it were, and uh, now I'm relatively comfortable at basic programming in a number of languages. Robin is an engineer who really knows his stuff, and he might well be able to help you, so uh, uh, head to the link in the description of this video if you would like to watch the Ele uh, Electromaker Educator Programming Languages video. Moving on to a Mac with an e-paper display. Now, I'm sure some of the Mac users out there just got very, very excited at the concept of a shiny new MacBook with an e-paper display, but this isn't quite that. Actually, it's cooler. Paper Mac is a project by Dave Luna, and this is, yes, a Macintosh Classic 2 with an e-paper display. Uh, I love this as well. Uh, introducing my latest retro computer, a uh, computing abomination, the Paper Mac. This is not an abomination, this is a thing of beauty. Uh, now, it's a Macintosh Classic 2 with a 16 color grayscale e-ink uh, uh, screen, but inside is a Raspberry Pi. This isn't running the uh, original Apple II hardware. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. To get an e-paper display running with the original hardware would be near to impossible. And while I may annoy some retro computer enthusiasts by saying this, it makes a lot more sense to emulate an Apple II at this stage than it does to actually try and maintain one, unless it's already working and it is, you know, perfectly in condition. I'm not saying rip apart working Apple IIs to put Raspberry Pis in them, but emulation at this stage makes a lot more sense than trying to restore one unless that's your passion. Oh, I've just annoyed all of the retro computer people out there, haven't I? Anyhow, there is a video of it in action, which we'll take a quick look at now. Now, a few things jumped out to me uh, about this project that was super cool. Uh, the first is that uh, an Arduino is used to uh, go between the original Apple peripherals um, and the Raspberry Pi. There's an ADB to a USB converter in there, which is courtesy of the Arduino Mega, I think it is, or an Arduino Micro, sorry. Um, the WaveShare display, this is a WaveShare 9.7 inch e-paper display, and the refresh rate on it looked pretty sharp. Um, as, soon, as soon as a button press happened, it kind of just updated immediately, um, which might not be all that surprising to you, but I still live in a universe where e-paper displays are slow and rubbish and not even worth having. Um, but yeah. I love these projects. If you've watched the show for any amount of time, you know that I love uh, taking old things and using technology to bring them back to life. Um, again, I know that annoys some people because they want to keep the technology as it was, but I really like this. I kind of feel like there's a lot of old shell computers that are waiting for someone to have the time to actually repair them who never will. And now they can live again as these kind of projects. Um, and yeah, uh, this is something that truly appeals to me. And if you do have a project like this or a plan for a project like this, please do let me know about it in the comments or even better, 
um, when you start doing it, start documenting it on the Electromaker website so we can take a look at it. And as you just saw earlier in the show, you could win stuff just for doing that. Um, there's, uh, yeah, this is a really lovely blog post. I will link the blog post in the description. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I just, the aesthetics of this just make me so happy. <laughs> Now, moving on to wearable tech. Uh, there's a bunch of different forms of wearable tech. I mean, of course, we all wear things like earbuds and all that stuff, um, but we're talking about the real maker end of things. And conductive fabric is one of the bedrocks of wearable tech. It is fabric that, well, that conducts electricity. And if you are someone who fiddles with any kind of microcontrollers for long enough, you begin to realize that almost anything that conducts electricity in any way um, is going to be useful in a project. Um, but getting started with conductive fabric can be a little bit daunting, especially if you, like me, have very little experience with tailoring and sewing and all that kind of stuff. And that's where this Instructable is fantastic. So this project on Instructables from Christine Farian is just a completely uh, a full guide to getting started with conductive fabric. And uh, what you're seeing in the image here is, is conductive fabric. These pieces of fabric conduct electricity. And the boards that she, are use, she uses in this project, uh, she has one um, Arduino code example and one Circuit Python code example. And the board itself is a Circuit Playground from uh, Adafruit. You can use any board that supports capacitive touch. And in fact, you can make any board pretty much support capacitive touch by using a bigger of resistor that's another story for another day but in short this is very accessible uh, there's a lot of different boards you could do this project with and this conductive fabric is widely available online for quite cheap um, but what you're seeing here is different places that you can touch this in order to trigger different things. You could have this under the sleeve of your jumper, like I have right now, and pressing each one of these different things could trigger lights on my body. It could send messages from a, a Wi-Fi connected ESP32 on a belt I have on with a battery. The possibilities are pretty much endless. But the great thing about this Instructable is that whether you're coming from a tailoring and sewing background and moving into electronics, or like me, you're coming from the electronics side of things and moving into the tailoring and sewing, um, it is designed to be accessible to everybody with very little experience beforehand. So this shows you the supplies you will need for sewing the conductive fabric to things, and it also shows you in great detail how you can start sewing it together and exactly how you can make it work. Um, even down to the very small fundamental things like here, like showing you exactly how you can stitch things together and get the right shapes so that it will work and fit around your arm. Um, th this might seem like child's play to you if you've made something before using a needle and thread. Um, the, the last time I used a needle and thread, I was a child making a teddy bear from a teddy bear kit at craft day at school or something like that. Um, I still have the teddy bear though. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the electronic side, and uh, she shows you how you can make custom crocodile clips, or you can just use normal crocodile clips and attach them to a, a development board. And once you have it all working, of course, this could be something that was all completely hidden inside the sleeve, or like I said before, run down to a thing on your belt, or whatever. Um, and uh, it gives Arduino code for a circuit playground, which is um, a, an Adafruit board with a bunch of useful stuff on board, which has touch sensitivity built into it already. But there's other Arduino boards you can use too. And in fact, I may have already said earlier enough, you, earlier that you can use a, a large resistor to turn any board into a capacitive touch board. It just so happens that that is no longer true. It's even easier than it used to be. But anyway, put simply, Arduino compatible boards will work with this project, pretty much any board, I think, um, because the way ADC touch works, um, it does all of the capacitive touch stuff internally on the board, so you don't have to think about it. It's a library that just says, is someone touching the fabric or not? That's all I need to know. Now, the quality of this Instructable is incredible, and it makes sense that it's incredible because it was written by, as I mentioned, Christine Farian, and she is very experienced in the world of wearables. She is, uh, as it says here, a maker, breaker, tinker, tailor, education, electronics, and exploring, prototyping as she goes. And um, yeah, uh, her site has got a bunch of amazing things on too. Um, this one specifically, where is it? There's one about making NeoPixel jewelry, which jumped out to be, there it is. Um, yeah, a color sensing fun wearable. Again, a really good project for someone like me who understands NeoPixels perfectly. I understand the technology behind this, but I've never actually tried to make a wearable. This is the kind of thing that I'm probably going to start with trying because I have all the bits I need to make it. Now, Christine has literally written the book on uh, wearable technology. Uh, there is a packed book out there uh, of hers. You can get it on your Kindle. You can get it on a paper book. Um, I have no reason to give this book a plug. I haven't read it myself yet, but I'm going to because I'm kind of excited to stumble across a new person who knows a lot, um, just like all that time ago when I found that guy that wrote the beautiful book about OpenSCAD that I still have to this day and it taught me to use OpenSCAD. Um, but for today, this Instructable will be linked in the description of the video. Everything else I have um, showed you is from her personal site, which is linked out here.
If you are enjoying the Electromaker show, it would mean a lot to me if you could like, comment, and subscribe, uh, but not necessarily in that order. Um, <laughs> subscribing to the channel is free, it doesn't cost you anything to do, and it just means that we will show up in your subscriptions tab on the side just here. Also, um, if you click this little bell and click all, you will get notifications within YouTube, not anywhere outside of your browser, hopefully, unless you turn browser notifications on. And under here, you will see, uh, here are a couple of um, uh, notifications I had from the Electromaker channel. And the other thing that would uh, really help is actually clicking the like button on any one of our videos. I know it is asinine for YouTubers to ask you for likes, um, but it is something that is actually important to the YouTube algorithm. And if you click like, uh, yeah, it might show the show to more and more people. Um, we are slowly uh, gathering subscribers and it is largely down to the help of the subscribers we already have who are talking about the show and doing the things that I have just mentioned. I know it's annoying when people ask you to do that, but it is free and it only takes a moment. However, if you would prefer to support us in a more practical way to you but that will actually cost you a little bit of money you can visit our store the Electromaker store stocks things from pretty much everybody in the maker and embedded sphere as it were sphere um yes uh, uh, raspberry pi arduino all your bigger names we also stock everything from adafruit and pimeroni uh, but also companies like udu who do uh, very interesting single board computers also x86 single board computers not dissimilar to the latte panda delta but we do also have the latte panda delta in stock right now if you're looking for a powerful single board computer um, yes, we are not immune to the shortages everyone else is facing, but if you do want something for your latest hobby project, do see if we have it in stock. Anything you buy from us will immediately help us at Electromaker to make the show better. We don't have any other sponsorship, we don't put any adverts on our shows, we don't have a Patreon, nothing, none of that, we just have a shop. So if you want to help us financially, think of us the next time you start a project. Anyway, thank you for your time, let's get on with the rest of the show. Now, in recent weeks, I have talked a lot about the Latte Panda 3 Delta because I reviewed it, um, because I wrote an opinion piece about single board computers versus mini PCs. Uh, spoiler alert, I think single board computers are fantastic. I think mini PCs don't really have a use case. Just get a cheap desktop. Um, and now, unfortunately, it is time for me to start to say goodbye to this Latte Panda 3 Delta because it is going to be given away to one of you subscribers to the Electromaker show, or the Electromaker YouTube channel, sorry. Um, on the off chance that you haven't heard me talk about this or aren't familiar with it, the Latte Panda 3 Delta is an x86 single board computer. That means it can run Windows or Linux natively. Um, it has an Intel Celeron processor in there, but don't let that put you off. Uh, Celeron processors are really, really good now. Gone are the days of netbooks that couldn't really do anything. I played through the entire Portal 2 game on this uh, this little single board computer, and yes, that's not a particularly new game, um, but it, it, yeah, it, uh, it was fantastic. From my perspective, the thing about this that I really like the most is that um, it does break out some of its uh, things that you need. So if you wanted to put this in an enclosure or put it as part of a kiosk, um, you can uh, attach touchscreens to it. You can attach a camera to it very easily. The power and all of the switches are, bro uh, are break outable to the outside of a case. And it has two M2 slots on the bottom, one for an NVMe SSD. The other could be for a, I don't know, a 4G, 5G modem so that this always has connectivity no matter where it is. However, the thing that I find the most fun is that this has an 80 mega 32U4 chip on it. That is the same 80 mega chip that you will find inside an Arduino Leonardo. There it is just there. Uh, it's the same one you'll also find in an Arduino Micro. That means that attached to this uh, computer internally is an Arduino that you can just use. Um, if you uh, flash it with a Fermata sketch, which allows you to just control it over UART, um, over USB serial, sorry, um, you can basically just use normal Windows code, make a Windows application, with say a screen and a GUI and things that people could touch and then send things out through these GPIO pins. It's essentially a x86 Raspberry Pi-esque board with an Arduino built into it and yeah, I, as you can probably tell, I'm quite enthusiastic about this thing. But sadly, today is the day that I start to say goodbye because it is going to one of you. Now, the way that this competition will work is similar to the way that we've done other bigger competitions in the past, in that um, it will be a couple of weeks until we announce the winner of this contest, so there's enough time for everyone to see this giveaway is happening and to have a chance to enter. Um, and basically, if you go to the comment section of this video or to the comment section of wherever you see this, if it's a social media post you see, you can just reply there. The important thing is you leave the hashtag 3Delta, that's the number Number three, D E L T A, three delta. Uh, that means we can check that you have actually um, got this. You also need to be a subscriber to this YouTube channel to enter this contest. So do not enter until you've gone to a, a YouTube channel and clicked subscribe if you haven't. Um, comment, like, and subscribe. YouTube apparently likes it when you say those words in that order. Who knew? Um, 
And uh, yes, soon someone else will be playing with this amazing little single ball computer. Um, and I think that's kind of it. Uh, we're going to let this competition run for just a little while. We have a whole bag of really interesting things to give away over the coming weeks. The mystery box is still down here. Um, I have a mystery box of fun things I give away on the show every week when we don't have a special prize. Um, but for now, we're going to be starting this contest this week and there will be more contests to come. Somebody will be taking this Latte Panda 3 Delta home and doing very fun things with it. And I really hope you show me the things you make with it. Moving on to the part of the show we call Funding Website Things, where we look at things on funding websites. And this is a funding website called Crowdsupply, which is like Kickstarter, but only for cool hardware electronic projects. With that intro out the way, here's the exciting part. Now, do you remember the MNT reform? Um, it was this amazing, completely open source software and hardware laptop that was uh, crowdfunded here on Crowdsupply a while ago. It caused a massive splash, with a roughly half the people saying, this is an amazing idea, wow, and the other half of the people saying, this is an incredibly large amount of money to spend on a laptop with such low hardware hardware specs. But the idea behind the MNT reform was more of a philosophy than a consumer product. If you wanted to have a completely trusted from top to bottom software and hardware computer, this was the best thing that you could get at that time. And this is, well, unsurprisingly from the name, a pocket version of that device. Now, if you are familiar with Crowdsupply, you will realize that there is no price anywhere on this page, and that's because this has not been launched yet. This is the pre-launch page, um, and uh, if you would like to know more about it, there's a lot you can read here. However, the first paragraph I will read to you, uh, I think, explains it very well. MNT Pocket Reform is an extremely compact, fully featured mini laptop that is modular, upgradable, recyclable, and reusable. As fully open source hardware and software, it exemplifies MNT's principles while providing abundant connectivity and a pleasant typing experience thanks to a comfortable, ortholinear mechanical keyboard and miniature trackball. Pocket Reform features robust Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity and includes both Chromium and Firefox pre-installed, giving it the versatility it needs to shine in many different contexts. Now, if you want to know what MNT's principles are, you can follow the link here to the MNT Reform uh, Crowd Supply. This is the original one that made a massive splash all that time ago, and they raised almost half a million dollars for creating these laptops. Um, and as I said at the time, um, there were some people who thought it was the most wonderful thing in the world, and some people thought it was terrible because it was massively high priced, um, a massive high price for something that was nowhere near as powerful as any other computer of a similar type. However, that's not the point. If you are interested in this computer, you're interested in it because it is truly open hardware down to the the absolute bare metal itself and MNT pocket reform is going to be exactly the same. There is, of course, the other side to this as well, which is uh, clamshell, cyberdeck, little tiny computers are just inherently really, really cool. Um, and I've always wanted some kind of little clamshell computer like this. Um, and uh, yeah, this one is supposed to be more affordable as well. Exactly what that means, I don't know. It just is in the title here. Um, I don't know exactly how they'll make that that much more affordable, uh, but we're going to find out. Um, but yes, as mentioned before, if you are interested in a fully open hardware and software project, um, the MNT team are very interesting people. Their philosophy is unique, I think. There's a lot of people that walk, uh, talk the talk, but they're really trying to walk the walk. Um, and also, while this is not going to be as powerful as tablets, mobile phones, all that kind of stuff, it, to do certain things, um, if you want a tiny little pocket computer um, that is cute as hell and that has a you know, proper operating system on it, uh, that you can trust entirely from top to bottom with your security, this is going to be a really good thing to look at. As always, you can go to this box here and subscribe for more details on the uh, MNT Pocket Reform. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. And um, yeah, we will be coming back to this one before it launches. Well, no, when it launches. But yes, we'll be seeing how much this costs. We'll be coming back to it and going through all of the specs in detail then. We're staying on Crowd Supply with another pre-launch project, and this one is called Glow Stitch LEDs. Now, it's nice that this is in this show because we were just talking about Christine's fantastic instructable about conductive fabric. Now, one of the things that I was completely unaware of until I started researching it for this show is that um, conductive fabrics historically were very hard to use with sewing machines. You had to uh, stitch them by hand. They weren't compatible. I imagine they just got chewed up in the needle of the sewing machine. I'm not that familiar with them. However, these are sewing machine compatible, and as it says, they have micro LED stri strips, no soldering, and no code to use them, which for many people who are more interested in the making side of things than the coding side of it will be very desirable indeed. So here's an example of it at work. As you can see, this is a conductive strips that are being stuck onto pieces of paper, and that highlights another one of the features of this. These things can be painted over using regular paint without it being an issue. So as you see here, this is a, creating a night sky in order to paint some rockets over uh, the top of these LEDs, and underneath them, sticking some bits of uh, fabric on it, um, what's it called, uh, cotton buds on it, in order to make the fiery tails of the rockets. 
Now, if you are a parent or you're someone who works with children um, or you just spend time around small children, you will know how magic this idea is. That you can take a blank piece of paper and say to them, where would you like the sun to be? Where would you like the blue sea to be or whatever? And get them to just stick these things down using what looks like just tape and these magical weird little bead things. Then they paint their image over the top and then suddenly they have their own light up image like this. It really is a really, really nice idea. Really, 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 really. <laughs> Now, depending on what side of things you come from, you might find these a little bit limiting because they're not addressable LEDs. But to me, that's not a problem. I think there's nothing wrong with simplicity whatsoever. And having these non-addressable means you really just do need to think about your battery placement and where they are. And it's more about the hands-on side of it. Um, I am sure that someone with a technical enough mind could take this idea and run with it and make an addressable version. Maybe even if you contacted the creator about how to do that, it would be something you could collaborate on. After all, people that make these things aren't necessarily close to the idea of collaborating with other people. Just a thought. Anyway, Anyway, this is also a pre-launch project. You can add your name to the box here, which I will also be doing for this project because this is something that I could see myself actually, you know, using and fiddling with and uh, getting the boys to actually make their own light up things without having to start by soldering a bunch of LED strips and sticking them down on things. This is just fantastic for parents who, yeah, don't want hot soldering irons around tiny hands. We are going to close out the show this week by talking about Femto, which is a tiny little RP2040 development board, and an article that I wrote about SBCs and uh, mini PCs as to whether these two things are alike, which one has more use than the other. Uh, also, we'll be looking at a fantastic ESP32 guitar project, uh, which uses multiple ESP32s to basically 3D print a guitar from scratch. But first, that tiny little RP2040 board. So Femto. Femto is a Raspberry Pi uh, silicon board. It's an RP2040 board. Now I just want to hold this little Pi Pico up just for comparison because it is smaller than my little finger. You know, it's a very tiny little board. Uh, this, however, is Femto next to one. <laughs> um, it is an entirely different game. It is a really tiny development board, but it is a fully functional development board that breaks all the GPIO pins of the RP2040. Um, and as you can see below, it has a little shell here for attaching to it so you can actually solder to all those points as well. Um, down here, there is a USB-C tester, which uh, just uh, breaks out all of those LEDs, uh, GPIO pins to LEDs. Um, and yeah, this isn't a serious project, at least it doesn't seem to be at this stage, um, but it is a, a, a sign that in these days where you can get things fabricated so easily, why not try and make a ridiculously small board like this? Because who knows, maybe this particular kind of footprint might end up being the best way to work with RP2040 chips with PCBs. Um, you can, you know, the castellated edges of a Pi Pico I mean you can just stick this on a PCB. Why not have this with its little edges as well? Stick that on your PCB when you're developing it. I don't know, it's just a random thought. Uh, I just saw it and it kind of made me smile. I thought you might be interested in it. There's a link to it in the description and you can find everything, the PCB layout, the bill of materials at the GitHub link, which is just here. Um, but yes, I will leave a link to the CNX software article in the description of the video and you can find out everything else you need from there. Moving on to an article I wrote on the Electromica website. Um, now this article sort of came out of um, the more recent iteration of people saying something that's been said to me for years as a person that writes about and reviews single board computers, which is why not just buy a mini PC instead? It'll be either cheaper or, or better, depending on whether the single board computer is cheaper than a mini PC or more expensive. In the case of the Lato Panda 3 Delta here, um, this is an x86 single board computer that runs Windows. that has an Intel Celeron chip and it costs around $300. There are mini PCs out there which are over $100 cheaper with the same CPU in there. Um, in fact, the case study I used here was a GM Tech mini PC, and I want to make it clear, it's an amazing piece of kit. Um, let's find a little picture of it if we can. Oh, that's the Intel NUC uh, here in this video, um, if I can play it without it being too loud. Yes, this little GM Tech computer here, this tiny little cube you see, it's a marvelous device. It absolutely is. It's tiny. It has the same CPU as the Latte Panda Delta. It has dual channel RAM rather than single channel RAM, and it's only $189. So in this little social media video, the question I was uh, saying is kind of like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you get one of those mini PCs when it's cheaper and in some ways better than the Latte Panda 3 Delta? And my argument is that mini PCs are useless. <laughs> Now, I don't mean completely useless. I know I was being a little bit facetious with that argument. The idea, though, that I have, my sort of philosophy behind it, and what I go into in more detail in this article, is that there are laptops, which are portable computers, which have monitors and keyboards with them and batteries built into them. And then there are desktop computers, which are not as portable. Uh, they can be portable, but you would still need a monitor and a keyboard to plug into them. Then you have single board computers, which, again, you need to plug in a monitor and keyboard into, but they have much more utility. They can be uh, as, uh, used for physical computing, the Arduino 
Uno, uh, the Arduino uh, Leonardo chip inside here, the AT Mega 32U4, um, allows you to uh, do physical computing. And it's the same with the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi's pins. My argument is that mini PCs do not fit into any of these brackets. That, um, if you have a mini PC, you could probably just replace that with a single board computer of the same price or even cheaper. A Raspberry Pi 4 could probably do everything that you wanted a mini PC to do. And if you're getting a mini PC for any kind of performance, you'd be better served with a laptop or a desktop computer. I am perfectly willing to be proved wrong, but so far I haven't really had anyone that's been able to give me a convincing argument against it. However, this article is here. If you are interested in it, I will leave a link to it in the description and you can go through and you can tell me in the comments of this uh, very video here or on the website why I am completely wrong and out of my mind and mini PCs are the best thing since sliced bread, but I am still not convinced. I would like to be though. Lastly today we're looking at this project by Oliver Berlin, which is a truly wonderful device. This is a 3D printed guitar and let's quickly just see how it sounds. Now the brief example I just showed you kind of highlights how this thing works, although you should really watch the original video by Oliver Berlin. There's also a fantastic blog post in the uh, description of this. Um, if you look at the GitLab page and also his, uh, um, uh, his blog, it goes into a lot more detail as to how this thing works. However, essentially all of these different buttons work kind of like guitar frets do. And then the first line of buttons here that he's using his thumb were, uh, on, uh, are note triggers, and then the buttons below them are note trigger offs. So you can strum a chord, and then much like you would palm mute a guitar, strings to stop them playing you can palm mute that set of buttons or just press them all through the thing about this that is really impressive is that uh, this is entirely 3d printed and entirely fabricated from scratch using multiple esp32 development boards and easy to uh, easy to get components now, if you're interested in the musical side of it, you can, uh, like I say, watch the video and head to his blog. But just briefly, the technical side of it here is that there are, uh, I think, eight or was it six different ESP32 boards that are uh, taking care of all of these different button uh, inputs. And the way that they uh, work together is really interesting because the first one sends via serial all of its input uh, data to the next board, which sends it to the next board, which sends it to the next board. And this data package is what is then set, uh, turned into MIDI details that are sent to the computer. I hope I described that well. I've been recording for a long time today. Um, but you can see this basic setup in the video here. I'm not going to go into much more details about it right now. We're, uh, this show is run over anyway. I just wanted to highlight this project because it is truly a wonderful build, but also the idea behind it is really quite nice. Um, the, the idea of just uh, uh, daisy chaining all of the information down the ESP32 and then finally uh, sending that through USB to a computer, turning it into a general purpose MIDI controller, which acts a lot like a guitar. All right, folks, that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'm so glad to be back. Um, as I said before, YouTube seems to like it when people say the words like, comment, and subscribe in that order, so apologies for doing so. Um, and uh, if you are a new viewer to the show, I'd be interested to see what you think of the format. Um, I know there are some of you out there that have been watching the show for a very long time, and some of you have told me things that you've liked and what you haven't liked in a while, and uh, and I took that advice on, and uh, over the year have tried to kind of make the show fit into what I think the audience would like, but also it has to be fun for me to make too and now that we have yeah a bunch of new subscribers and new people watching the show who are talking to me on different channels to ones that i'm even used to i'm really interested to have constant criticism and feedback about what you guys like and what you guys don't like about the show um, we have some really exciting stuff coming up in the next few weeks in Electromaker, and uh, I'm just really glad to be back doing the show. I will see you next week right here on YouTube. Take care, stay creative, have fun. Bye-bye.